What does it mean to make a decision to follow Jesus? You ever think about that? I mean, when you think about decisions in life, and all of us make decisions, we make decisions all day long, we, we decide to get up, we decide to hit the snooze. Who are my snooze folks in the house? You're my snooze folks. You, how many of you guys, you plan to snooze? I mean, you, you plan your snooze before you set your alarm. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we've identified you right now. How many in the house tonight, you are a multiple alarm person for the same morning? You're like, you got one at six, one at 6.15, one at 6.30. You guys tracking? So we make decisions all the time, but what does it mean to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ? Tonight, I'm gonna ask that question. I'm gonna come back and give some answers to what that means, and my hope is tonight that if you're here and you've not made that decision, you will make that decision tonight. But my, also, my, my hope is also that if you have made that decision, that tonight in the message, you'll be reinforced in your faith and be encouraged to dig in a little bit deeper. We can always go one step closer to God. Uh, none of us know enough about God yet. We can learn more. God is infinite. So we want to kind of pursue after God as a, as a passionate way of living our life. So let's think about this. What does it mean to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. Before, before I get there, let me just give you a quick little nugget of theology. Think about this. What is our eternal hope? First Peter chapter one, verse three said, blessed be the God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he's given us this new birth into a living hope. Everybody say living hope. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, what we see here is an important wording because he says to us that the new birth we have through Jesus Christ, his resurrection, his death, his suffering upon the cross, is the pathway to a living hope. Salvation and the decision to follow Jesus Christ is a way of finding hope in this life. And tonight, again, I wanna just say to you, I'm gonna give you the invitation in a few moments to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. And if you've already made that, my hope is you will step in closer right now. Now, we ourselves, we have hope because of what God has done for us. We don't save ourselves. God has called us. God provided the pathway of salvation. We can't birth ourselves in the physical and we can't birth ourselves in the spiritual. God does that work for us. When salvation comes into our life, it begins to transform us, making us dead to our sinful past and alive in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are dead to our sin and we're alive in Jesus. Who tonight in the house, you are alive in Jesus right now. He has saved you, delivered you, set you free. Now, because of this new birth, we have a living hope. Now, this is different than just uh, a temporary hope. For example, you might be hoping for a new job. You might be hoping to uh, save some money. You might be hoping to go on a big vacation for Christmas. You might be hoping for the best Christmas ever. And, and you might have hope for this or that, but this is not a hope that fades away. This is a returning hope every day. Living hope is reinforced every day. This isn't wishful thinking hope. This is confident hope in who God is. And we understand that God's hope does not dissipate. And because of Jesus Christ, we can wake up with hope every day day of our life. You know, that's what our salvation does for us. And so when you think about this, we have built inside of us from salvation an eager, constant expectation. Hope is here through Jesus Christ. He is our living hope, and we live this way every day. And to follow Jesus is to follow a pathway of living hope. And this all begins with a decision to follow Jesus. What does it mean to decide to follow him? In the gospels, he often called the 12 the disciples. He would say, come and follow me. Yet he never said where they were going. In essence, he's saying, get in the car, buckle up, hold on tight, and let's go. He didn't say we're gonna go here, gonna go there. He just said, follow me. He would often call the multitude to follow him and they would follow him. Now what's unique is everybody enjoyed following when following felt and looked good. The Beatitudes, all the Sermon on the Mount, what great sayings Jesus brought to them and they were following. And then he began to discuss the crucifixion, his death upon the cross. Even those who had walked close began to follow a little bit further back. 
And then at one point, even his very own disciple denied Jesus three different times at the moment on the eve of the cross. Because they kept saying, hey, you're with him. Oh, I don't know him. Oh, no, you're with him. No, I don't know him. No, you're with him. I don't know him. Because sometimes following Jesus isn't always easy. And sometimes not everybody's a fan of you following Jesus. And sometimes, even in difficult times, following can make us question, God, are you still real? Are you still here? But we can know by faith that even when I don't sense God or feel God, I can know God is present in my life. Now, a decision to follow Jesus Christ is not a decision that comes from an emotion. Now, you might feel something, that's fine if you do, but it's really a decision you make in faith and trust in God's word. So tonight, you can choose to follow Jesus, and you can make that decision, and you might be overwhelmed with the emotional experience in your heart, that's fine. Or you might just say, you know what, Marty? I'm not living right, I'm living a sinful life, and tonight, I wanna go a different pathway. And you might not feel anything, but you just made a decision. Either way, God's gift of salvation can be yours even tonight. No matter if you feel something on the inside or if you just make a choice within the inside, you can still experience the freshness of salvation and saving grace tonight because God doesn't save you by your feelings. He saves you by the work upon the cross that Jesus Christ did for you and for me. And I thank God that he saved me tonight and he could save you as well. So follow me. Follow me, what's it mean? When we choose to follow Jesus Christ, it simply means that he has become everything to us. It, it's a little bit, I, I even hate to draw an analogy, but it's, it's akin to getting married. When you get married, you don't tell your spouse, hey, I wanna marry you and this is my life, I'm gonna add you on to the list of things I do. Someone just said, well, that's what I did wrong. <laughs> no, when you get married, your spouse becomes the center of everything you do. When you give your heart to Jesus Christ, you're not saying, hey, Jesus, come in my heart. I've got a busy schedule. I've got a busy life. I'll work you in somewhere that it works for both of us. No, what you're saying is Jesus be the center of it all. Everything comes to you, everything comes through you. It's all about you, Jesus. Everything revolves around you. You're the source, you're the reason, you're the hope, you're my life, you're my love, you're my everything. You put Jesus in the center and that's where the decision begins. A lot of folks wanna add Jesus onto their life. They wanna add him into the mix of an already busy agenda, and he doesn't operate that way. He, he, he just won't be in second place. The very first commandment we have in the Old Testament is I am the Lord your God, and you will not have any other gods before me. He's clarifying right there, there's only one true living God, there is no second God, there is one God and there is not a second close place. He is the creator, he's the alpha, the omega, he is the, the giver of life, he is the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he will not have a second place anywhere close and he won't be second place. So to follow Jesus is to make a decision to make him everything in our life. Now, it's true that all of us try to follow something in this life. We all follow people, we follow culture, we follow family, we follow ourselves. We tend to follow even our own desires sometimes. But we can't follow Jesus plus something. We have to follow him and everything comes else, else comes way after he is clearly Lord in our life. So what does it mean to make a decision to follow Jesus? Four quick things real fast. If you're a note taker, write these down. If you're not a note taker, write these things down still. First of all, to follow Jesus is to live with eternity in mind right now. Let me just help you. The Christian faith is not a dying man's religion. It's a living man's faith. 
It's not just for when you die, it's for when you live. It's for today. Let me just help you. Let me make an announcement tonight. Did you know that eternity is already in session for you? As a believer in Jesus Christ, you're already stepping into eternal hope and you live today with eternity in mind. Here's what you think about this way. Ecclesiastes says that God has put inside the heart of every human being. He's built inside of us the craving for what's to come. We are built with a desire for what has not yet happened. We are longing for this place and for believers, we call this place heaven, but listen to me. Believing in Jesus is not just to get you into heaven, it's to get heaven into you. That's what it means to follow Jesus Christ. It's not just when you die, it's how you live. It's not just for your funeral, it's for your next day, it's for tomorrow. It's not just for a thousand years out, it's for this next five seconds. To follow Jesus Christ is to embrace the fact that God has put eternity in the heart of every human being and we're the only creation that thinks about this. No other creature thinks about eternal life, but we do because God has put it inside of us. The reality is that we tend to struggle as people to plan the next five days. We tend to struggle to plan the future, but we have to be aware that following Jesus is to put eternity in our hearts every day. Every decision, every place, everything, every step, every conversation, begin to think eternal. I would say it this way, have a few friends in your life with eternity in mind. Find some people that need Jesus all the time and build that connection, build that relationship, and begin to put a focus on finding a way to get that person to accept Jesus Christ so that one day in heaven, you will see your friend across heaven's floor and you'll go, I knew you'd make it in this house. Begin to live your life in every aspect with eternal thoughts about your friends, your family, and your own self. Live every day with eternity in mind. Here's number two, quick, you guys still here? Say yes. Number, you still here? Scare me. Number two, start and stay on the journey of knowing God. You can't know God in a few seconds. You have to unpack the knowledge of God. You have to discover God through his word. You have to dig in deeper. I encourage you, I encourage my churches all the time. When you come to church, take notes. When you come to church, listen to the message. When you go home, re-watch the message and take more notes and begin to pull back the layers of what's happening in God's word. Understand that this book right here is given to us by the eternal creator of all things, an eternal God who's always been, always will be. Don't minimize your discovery of God to just the verse of the day. I love technology, lots of cool ways to get verses sent to you, but if you're not careful, you'll miss how good God is. I love this in the scriptures, I love this in John 17, Jesus said, uh, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you, for you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to those who have given to, you've given to him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Watch this, I've brought you glory on the earth by finishing the work you gave to me, and now, Father, glorify me to your presence with the glory I had before the world began. Watch this, he's saying here, Father, I pray that they'll come to know you. Following Jesus is to decide to learn who God is on a regular basis. Again, pick up your scripture every day, unpack this, read this, discover this, learn to know this. Let me give you an example. Even in married life, you learn stuff all the time. How many in the house are married 20 years? And you're still learning stuff. How many in the house you're married 30 years? Still learning stuff. How many in the house you're married 40 years? You're still learning stuff. How many in the house, you're married 50 years? Who's my 50 year people? At 50 years, who's 50, 50 years, come on. At 50 years, you don't care to learn anything else. You're like, we're here, we're not going nowhere, we're stuck together. No, but do you think you can learn all about God in a few seconds? Let me say it to you this way, the devil, how I many know we have a real adversary out there? The devil would love to have the church ignorant about God because he knows if you ever discover who God is, 
you'll know how good God is. You'll know that God is not a bad God, but God's a good God. And he knows that he can't keep blaming God for stuff he's done if you discover how good God is. If you discover how grace works, how favor works, how God's goodness works, if you discover how salvation works, if you discover the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, if you discover the power of the truth, the word word of God, the devil knows if you ever discover the riches of God, the goodness of God, the favor of God, the love of God, you will always focus on God and he cannot control you, he cannot tempt you, he cannot test you, he cannot attack you, he cannot stress you, he cannot give you anxiety, he cannot give you worry because you'll know how good your God is Hear me to that legacy church. We have a good God. He's a faithful God. He's a loving God. He's a kind God. He's a true God. And you have to discover God through his word. Now, a lot of folks want to find out who God is without the, without the Bible. A lot of folks want to say, well, I have a relationship with God, but I don't believe this book. It doesn't work that way. This is a book of truth from God for his creation, for his people. This is the word of God. Live your life by this text. The culture today loves to self-interpret things. And and they love to defy the obvious. For example, my wife and I were flying somewhere a few months ago. We were going to a little island jumper from point A to point B. And um, it's a small plane. So the guy looks at me and says, how much do you weigh? He never asked my wife that, but he asked me that question. And I said, I weigh 165. (laughs) What are you guys laughing for? I said to the guy, he looked at me, he goes, really? I went, I identify as 165. (laughs) He starts laughing. And I gave him, and we went back and forth. I said, you don't think I weigh 165? I feel like 165. He said, man, I gotta know how much you weigh so I can balance the plane. So I gave him the real number and the plane did just fine. Real number somewhere between 250, or between 165 and 500. Somewhere in that (laughs) equation is the real number. But let me ask this question. How passionate are you to know God? To really dig in deep. To, to move beyond the surface of just coming to church and hearing a message, and you need to do that, but going home and re-listening and discovering and pulling apart what God's word says. I always encourage my church, when you come to church, to, to bring your Bible, and here's why. A lot of folks will say, Marty, I got my Bible on my phone, and my answer is I do too. But there's been many times I kicked off in John 3 and found myself on Amazon. Anybody else? <laughs> or I kicked off in, in, in Second Chronicles and found myself on Facebook. I, I just want to encourage you, however you have to do, and I'm not criticizing methods. My point is, create the clarity that you're here tonight and you come to church to learn about God. Discover the goodness of God, the favor of God, the love of God, because God is indeed, come on, say, say God is. Come on, say God is a good God. Can we just thank God tonight for his goodness in our lives? He's such a good God. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 9 says it this way, verse 23, it says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. If it was said of you that you're the wisest person on the earth, would that be enough? If it was said of you that you're the strongest on the earth, would that be enough? If it was said of you that you're the richest on the earth, would that be enough? Or if it was said of you that this person truly knows who God is, his nature, his attributes, his character, his kindness, his judgments, 
his righteousness. I challenge you tonight, lean into learning who God is through God's book. Don't learn who God is without God's book because that's where you create God in your image, not you in God's image. This book here is your pathway to knowing who God is and this is how you follow Jesus Christ. Number three, here we go, we're almost done. Repentance, everybody say repentance. To follow Jesus is to repent of our old nature without God and to step into the acceptance of our new nature with God. Now think of it this way. We all understand that when you go through a car wash, the car gets washed, all the dirt comes off. By the way, if you're married, I highly recommend you try kissing your spouse in the car wash. It's 15 seconds long. All the lights are moving around. You got the bubbles on the car. It's highly a romantic experience. If you're not married, mind your own business in the car wash. But we all understand that in a car wash, the, 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 the car gets washed and you come on the other side and man, you go, man, look how sharp my car looks. Nobody would ever go and collect all that dirt back and pour it on top of the car. Or, or if you've ever bathed your kids and kids can leave that ring around the tub from the day of dirt on the outside. And you've never gotten your kid out of the bathtub and set them down to dry them off and then went back with a bucket and grabbed all the dirt and poured it back on their head. Then why do we come to Jesus who's here to cleanse us and try to bring all the dirt with us? Did you know that through the power of Jesus Christ you can leave your sinful past and you can cleave to the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Do you know that, that you can change who you were and be a new person? Look at the scriptural fast, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, or 15, it says, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and was raised again. In other words, when you come to Jesus, you don't live for you, you live for him now. So from now on, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, it says. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is what? It's gone, and the new is here. Come on, say, it's gone. Come on, say, the old is gone. Now say, the new is here. Do you see that? That means when I come to Jesus and I decide to follow Jesus, my old nature, my old ways are behind me. I'm going a brand new path of the power of the authority of the word of God over my life and I can now live a different life. You know, that can change how you talk. It can change the places you go. It can change the friendships you have. It can change how your mind works, change how your finance works. It can change everything about you. Years ago, I was doing some marriage counseling in my office with a couple, and, and they were having some tension in marriage because she, she liked to yell at her husband. She was a yeller, self-proclaimed yeller. And we're talking, and as she began to talk, she began to get more excited and get her voice kind of elevated. I'm like, I can see this. And she starts talking at a high level, talking to me. And I'm trying to explain, hey, you know, in adult relationships and married life and yelling at your spouse, not a good plan, and it really affects people's relationship and emotions and how you talk to people. And we're having this long conversation and she's trying to defend being a yeller because she's like, I just, I've always yelled my whole life. My family yells, I yell. And then as I kept pressing in, she goes, I yell because I'm Sicilian. And I, I looked at her and said, I'm sorry, I thought you were a Christian. <laughs> See, watch, our, our old nature wants to tell us that you're a certain way because of who you are. In Jesus Christ, the old is gone, the new has arrived. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, the new has arrived. It can change everything about your life tonight. When you decide to follow Jesus Christ, you repent of your past, you leave your past. Repentance is not just I'm sorry. Repentance is leaving something and grabbing hold of Jesus Christ. That's repentance. 
It's not just I made a mistake, forgive me, I apologize, I won't do it again. I mean, honestly, if, if that was enough, I'd be off the Oreos right now. <laughs> but repentance is turning from and turning toward Jesus. When you decide to follow Jesus Christ, you're leaving your past, you're stepping into the newness of life. The fourth and final thing we see in the conversation, a decision to follow Jesus is living, watch this, listen close, living as a citizen with God's people and a member of God's household. You're part of a family. In a natural sense, I have, I have one brother, I have a mom and a dad, in married life, I have a wife, we have a family, we have two sons. By marital relationship, I have in-laws, I have sister-in-laws, I have brother-in-laws, I have nieces, I have nephews, I have a family. But did you know that in Jesus Christ, tonight, I'm also looking at my family? Do you know that we're part of the family of God? And do you know that Although I only have one biological brother, tonight I have many brothers in the house of God right now. And every man in here is my brother. And every woman in here tonight, you're my sister in Jesus Christ. You're part of a family. And we have to live with that awareness. We're governed now by God's word. And now God's word tells us what to do. God's word instructs us and God's word talks about how do we interact together with each other. Because God understands that sometimes the kids don't get along very well. See, watch what happens in parenting. You know this to be true because you did it when you were a kid and you've watched your kids do it. When the, when the dad turns his head, the kids punch the, each other. True or false? And how many of you guys did that? I got a brother. Brothers fight. That's what they do. When mom and dad look this way, it's coming out. And then when mom and dad look back, you go, oh, I didn't do nothing. See, we gotta realize we have a father, watch this, who's always looking. And therefore, we relate to each other with the awareness of God's watching us. Ephesians 2 gives a lot of picture words about this connection, this body, this citizenship of God's kingdom governed by his word, his will, his ways. As believers in Jesus Christ, when we decide to follow him, we're stepping into the family of God. We're not by ourselves. You're not isolated from the enemy. You have a family, stay in the herd. This is the herd, the herd's a safe place. The devil loves to get you isolated. The devil loves to get you by yourself. The devil loves to get you where he can isolate you, cast out, bring on fears, bring on stress, bring on worries. But I don't know about you, something happens different in my spirit when I get into the household of God, around the people of God, worshiping the same God. And what's so cool about the body of Christ is I can be in a place of people I don't even know their stories. They don't know my story. I could be in a different country. I can be hearing a whole different language. But we're serving the same God. And when the service starts and the worship goes forth and we're worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the God most high, the creator of all things, we're worshiping Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Everything begins to change. And all of a sudden, we're not different. We're family. We're coming together under the authority of God's kingdom. And so when you choose to follow Jesus Christ, you're leaving the isolation that the enemy wants to keep you in. And you're stepping into the family of God, into a place where we can arm together and we can attack the devil. And we know what happens. We know we win in the end. And he knows that too. He's aware of his fate. And we step in that fate too. Or they're trusting that fate is going to happen too. And we know through God's word that we will be victorious through the power of Jesus Christ. When you decide to follow Jesus Christ, you're stepping into the family of God. God has a good family. I know, I know sometimes family can have challenges. I mean, everybody's got that one person's kind of weird in the family, right? And they kind of talk about them at Christmases and Thanksgivings. If you're thinking, no, we don't have that, that's because that's you, and they're talking about you. <laughs> they just ain't told you yet. And I realize that, I mean, people are people. And let's be honest, we're all a little bit different. 
And we're all a little bit weird sometimes. But you know what? That's okay. Because we're still family. And when I understand that God is my God, my Father, Jesus is my Savior, the Holy Spirit reigns and rules in my life, and the saints present for your life, we can get past all the uniquenesses and we can talk about how good God is. When you step into the family of God, when you decide to follow Jesus Christ, you're not by yourself anymore. You've got family. People who've been there with you, people who will cry with you. One of the things I love about Legacy Church is this is a large church with a small sense of community. And it's so connectable, so relatable. And you're in a place of people that have overcome things. And if you're battling the night, you're not by yourself. You're probably sitting right by an overcomer, you just don't know it yet. You're sitting by someone who got delivered, you just don't know it yet. And when you understand that we're in this together and that God is a good God and that we're part of the family, man, it makes you wanna come in a little closer, doesn't it? That you can know you're loved as you are but not left as you are. A lot of folks, when it comes to making a choice for Jesus, they often say, man, Marty, I've done a lot of bad stuff. Let me tell you what, nothing, nothing, nothing that you've ever done will keep you from God's love when you come running back to God. <laughs> nothing will. Jesus died for every type of sin. Jesus died for what we call the small sins or the big sins. Jesus died for all mankind. And Jesus died for sinners just like me. And here's the reality. I hadn't even sinned yet when Jesus died for my sins. But on that day at the cross, all my sins were there. He paid the price. And through the power of Jesus Christ, I can live my life free of shame, free of guilt, and I can live a different life. And tonight, I wanna invite you to make a decision to follow Jesus. And if you've made that decision, I wanna invite you to step in one foot closer to following Jesus. Take one step closer than you were yesterday. One step closer the next day. Let every day be one step closer to encountering God's presence. Because God's a real God. And tonight, you can follow him. Come to your feet real fast across the house, please, quickly and reverently, please. And if you're online, just stay focused right here for the online crowd as well. Tonight, I wanna give you this, a moment to make a decision to follow Jesus. And we'll say a prayer of faith with you right there where you stand today. And then we're gonna close with a second prayer and that is just to encourage you in your faith to take one step closer every day. But tonight, if you're here, you say, Marty, I've not been living a life that glorifies and honors God. But tonight, I wanna make a decision to follow Jesus. In a moment, I'm gonna count to three. Have you throw your hand up high? and make a declaration that tonight I wanna to choose to follow him. And this will be the beginning. This isn't the end, this is the beginning. This isn't all there is, there's more to the journey. This is just the starting point saying, I'm choosing to make the decision. You might say, man, I got questions. Well, I have questions too. We don't all know about God and all we can know. God's vast. That's why we step and we study. That's why we lean in. We, we grow together through discipleship and study through uncovering God's word. But tonight, don't leave here without the assurance of eternal life, without knowing your sins are washed away. You have the assurance of heaven and you're part of the family of God. So when I count to three in just a second, don't be slow, don't be shy, don't be ashamed. Throw your hand as high as you can. And say, tonight, I already got hands going up. Tonight is the night. I did an altar call a few weeks ago and a guy was in the back going like this, had both hands like he's flagging an airplane down. Like, don't miss me, I wanna make a decision to follow Jesus tonight. So with that kind of fervor tonight, when I hit three, put your hand as high as you can and say, tonight I wanna follow Jesus. One, two, three, hand as high as you can. Right now. Just put it as high as you can, high as you can. You can't hand up high, keep your hand up high. At one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 
44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, anybody else? 59, 60. Why do I count? Because every number has a name, every name has a story, and every story matters to God. Tonight, when your hand went up, you matter to God. I'm gonna pray with you right now, real quick prayer of faith. We're gonna all pray together. Are you ready to pray, church? Say yes. yes. Let's pray, come on, say, Father God, Father God I, thank I thank you for sending Jesus to be my Savior. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. I confess tonight that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And tonight I announce you, as the risen Son of God, my Savior and my Lord. In your name I pray, amen. Come on, give God a hand for saving grace tonight.